Well, greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome to tonight's night ending bonus upload. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost you a cent. Click that like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help this channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump into tonight's night ending bonus, shall we? All right, guys, so tonight's night ending bonus upload uh, this experience is one of those experiences that when people ask me, hey, what is uh, the most horrific experience that you've ever heard or the most violent experience that you've ever heard, this would be up there in the top five, I'd say. Uh, Jesse and his son is probably number one um, for me just because of the fact that it was a small child taken in front of his mom and dad um, and then what the government proceeded to do to his family afterward. Um, this experience, like I said, is right up there with it. It's just absolutely horrific. Uh, really tears at your heartstrings. Let's get into it. Today's first encounter. In the early days of February, just before my senior year, I was prompted by my dad to undertake a rite of passage, as he called it. I was to be left alone and fend for myself in a section of Tennessee's Cherokee National Forest for three days and two nights. I'm against the trip from the beginning. Sure, I like hunting and camping, but this was extreme. Too extreme for my tastes. But it was tradition passed down from father to son in my family for generations. Who was I to break tradition? So against my reservations and against the feeling that this was a bad idea, I packed my backpack, grabbed my .30-06 bolt-action rifle, and climbed into the cab of my dad's pickup truck. It was a long drive, and I was a little pissed that my dad was basically forcing this upon me. And our uneasy silence only made the hours feel like days. We only stopped once at a gas station about 10 miles from the cabin. It was 15 miles of dirt to my dad's cabin that his granddad had left him, which would, in turn, be left to me. It was tradition, after all. But... I wouldn't be getting any luxury of the cabin, no. We were parking the truck and my dad was driving me up deeper into the woods on a four-wheeler to a random, undisclosed point. I would then have three days to find my way back. If I succeeded, I'd become a man in my dad's eyes, and we'd also be getting a new swimming pool for the summer. It was bribery, but... I would be going into my senior year in August, and having a big pool would cement my popularity. It was vain, and I was doing this for the most selfish reasons, but I also wanted to make my dad proud. I stepped out of the toasted truck to calm the frigid forest air. The cabin was a small two-story log affair, worn from age, but obviously well-maintained. A new wooden wraparound porch was built last summer and was in need of some stain 
that we had never gotten to, but otherwise the ca cabin was pristine. It was a tremendous peaceful place, far removed from the troubles of civilization, and I felt like I was intruding on hollowed ground. I brushed off the shiver that clawed down my spine and buttoned my long jacket to my neck. Immediately, most of the chill went away, and I shook it off with ease. Before I could take a step to the cabin, my dad came around the front of the truck and held out his hand. Thomas, hand me your bag, he demanded. In a court nonsense tone, he, was told, he told me to hand him my backpack. I did so without question, and he immediately went inside, telling me to wait on the porch. I marched across the wood and sat in a rocking chair while my dad bustled around inside. I loaded everything you'll need for three days in that bag. You have a couple of days of food, but it's only for emergency. I also added a flare gun for an actual emergency. He handed me back my bag. It was stuffed full. A lot had been added to it, so much that string strained against the nylon fabric. I hefted it onto my shoulders, and though it was much heavier than before, it was not cumbersome. I could carry it all day, and I didn't think it would bother me. After he handed me my pack, we unloaded the four-wheeler from the back of the truck, and we set off the small walking trail next to the cabin. From memory, the path went on for a dozen miles and followed the stream as it snaked through the wilderness. We rode until the dirt road ended and humanity fell away to deep woods. The ride got bumpy as we would go around trees over small rocks. And for a minute, I was afraid of the hazards. My dad was an experienced outdoorsman, though, and knew these woods quite well. A few hours later, we apparently reached the destination. It was a small clearing, nestled under a copse that remains previous campsite long since put, out rested in the center of the dirt surrounded by a circle of rocks. <clears throat> I was up there scouting a couple of weeks ago, so I knew the route I would take back, he said, cheeky. Be careful, son, and call me if there's an emergency. I'm only a few hours away and I should be able to see the flare if there is any trouble. Yeah, because I'll be able to get signal out here, I replied, holding up my now useless phone. Well, there's always the flare gun, but I'm confident you'll be fine, and besides, the flares are really only there if you decide to give up, he said, laughing. With a parting wave, he departed, rolling back down the mountain and leaving me stranded in the woods. The first thing I did was take inventory and catalog my belongings. I undid the pack and carefully emptied its contents on the ground. I had a pair of long johns, some extra socks, some underwear, a box of matches, a hunting knife, a miniature shovel, a Ziploc bag full of blended spices, a canteen of water, two days of vacuum sealed rations and water pouches and the flare gun, along with my hammock and a blanket. I had everything I needed to make camp and survive if my hunting skills proved to be lacking. I had over 30 miles of wilderness to hack through before I hit the main road and could circle back to the cabin on the main road. Dad told me it should take me at least two days, three, if I didn't get lucky with my hunts. I had a few hours to kill before nightfall and wanted to get some miles in and find my bearings. The best bet... I thought would be to hike along the stream until it ended. It was somewhat close to the trail, but not exactly on it, as using the trail would be cheating. It would give me an excellent landmark and keep me oriented. So with mild hesitation, I packed up and set off through the woods. Now I'd have to hunt before it got dark if I didn't want to go hungry, and I only had an hour or two before light fell enough to make hunting impossible. After searching around for ten minutes or so, I found a good spot to set up camp for the evening. I dropped my bag and grabbed my rifle, chambered a cartridge, and double-checked the safety. My game was rabbit, since I didn't have the tools needed to string up and gut a deer. I set off and crept through the brush, looking for signs of a nearby den. Rabbit are most active at dawn or dusk, so it was perfect time to hunt. 
Less than five minutes later, I found signs of rabbit trail in the underbrush a few hundred yards from camp. I leaned against a tree and just waited. The rabbit I wanted appeared a half an hour later, hopping out of the brush without a care in the world. It was a plump eastern cottontail. It stopped, sniffed, giving me an opening. The crack of my rifle pierced the air, and the cottontail dropped. I'd hit my mark, taking it in the neck, so as not to spoil any of the meat, and it was a decent-sized rabbit, more than enough for dinner. I bagged it and went back to camp. Light was fading as I reached camp, which I made a fire priority number one. When I had light to work by, I cleaned the rabbit, making sure not to perforate the bowels and remove the organs and skin. I walked away from camp and buried the awful, awful and hid it in a small hole next to the tree. When the meat was cleaned, I rubbed some spices into the meat to remove some of the taste of the game and skewered it on a stick that I had sharpened. I was not the best cook and didn't have the right tools and ingredients, so the meat was a little dry and bland, but it filled me up nicely. And I washed it down with a swig from my canteen. Even I even had leftovers. I wrapped them in a cloth and set them by the fire, ready to be eaten for breakfast in the morning. With nothing else to do for the evening, and night had fallen an hour ago, I decided to turn in for the evening and get an early start in morning. I had many miles to cover, and I would have to hunt again at some point the next day. In morning, I woke up refreshed from one of the best nights sleep I'd ever had, and I was eager to take the day. I was in such a good mood that it took me a few minutes to realize that something was off. In the middle of packing up my hammock and gathering my supplies, I couldn't help but notice that the leftover rabbit was missing from next to the fire. I searched around in vain, thinking the wind might have caught in it and blown it out of camp, but there was nothing. I chalked it up to a wild animal, but that unsettled me. Deer often... Deer don't often eat meat, and I didn't think it was a deer anyway. The smoke from the embers of the fire would have been enough to keep most animals away. Black bear are common enough in the forest, but they should stay hibernating during this time of year. Right now, there wasn't anything larger than deer in these woods. So, unless it was a coyote, it'd have to have been a deer. But there were no tracks anywhere around my camp, so no answers came. I packed up camp and went to relieve myself when I found something that confused and terrified me. I went to piss by the tree where I had buried the awful of the rabbit last night. And right where I had buried them was a hole. It was rough with long claw marks gouged deep into the dirt as if something had ripped into the ground to get what I had buried. I buried them deep enough not to attract the scent from a wild animal. And I had never seen claw marks like these next to a tree. I didn't know what to make of them. Wild animals weren't that smart, and they're naturally skittish. No animal would risk getting close to a human unless they were starving, and no human had claws like this. Without hesitation, I grabbed my rifle and racked it round. I was petrified. I walked the camp in a circle, spread out, searching for any tracks. The only ones I had found were some deer tracks around a 100 yards from camp. But they were at least a couple days old. There was nothing else even remotely resembling marks. There was nothing for me to find, and even though I was freaked out, I still had to hike back to civilization as the miles wore on, I began to rationalize the experience, thinking it to be nothing more than a hungry animal looking for food, brave enough to sneak into my camp. I just hadn't buried the offal deep enough, and some critter smelled it. That was all it was. I managed to bag another rabbit purely on coincidence as it scampered out of the tree line. After the rabbit was clean, I wrapped the meat in a cloth and stowed it away. I was hungry from the hike and the fact that my breakfast had been stolen that morning, but I still wanted to put miles under my boots before it got dark. As sunlight faded from the canopy, my aching feet demanded a break and I found a spot to set up camp. 
It was a small campsite, campsite nestled up against a rocky mound that stretched skyward for a couple dozen feet with a slanted shelf near the top. I felt comfortable having my back to the wall and a brace of trees next to the rock ensure I could set my hammock up. I readied the campsite, built a roaring fire twice as large as the one last night just to scare away any nearby animals and cooked the rabbit to perfection. I was ravenous and scarfed down the meat with a gusto despite my hunger. There was still plenty of leftovers again, but this time I was careful to stow the meat inside of my pack which I kept next to the hammock. Exhaustion had wore me down from the many miles that I had walked that day, and I was eager to get some sleep. I lied my head on my pillow, and I was out like a light. The stillness woke me, like a veil of silence had been draped over the woods. Not a single sound rose from the forest floor other than the rustling of leaves in the wind. Not even crickets, animals instinctively go quiet with the presence of a predator, but this was unlike anything I had ever felt before. I laid my hammock, straining my ears, trying to listen for any sound that I could hear. The fire had died out, leaving only coals that sparkled every time a stiff breeze rolled in. The moon was fat in the sky and gave me ample light to see by as I stared up at the trees. For some reason, I was terrified to get up and look around. My rifle was next to me, resting just by my head against a tree. I could grab it in seconds and there was a round already chambered. But I couldn't reach for the gun. Couldn't do anything other than stare straight ahead and try not to move an inch. Because I realized something was out there watching me. It's hard to describe that feeling. I knew what it was on a primal, primal level. Something instinctual. Right alongside the fear of being alone in the dark, I knew that feeling as well. The presence persisted for a few more minutes and didn't fade. Sweat poured down my neck as I fought to stay still. Eventually, the silence and fear got to me, and I had to do something. I couldn't take it anymore. From the hammock, hitting the ground hard, I ignored the pain radiating from my arms and scrambled for my rifle, scanning all around, trying to find whatever it was. As I spun around, I saw it perched on the rocks above me. For a single split second, a flash of neon blue eyes stared back at me from an angular, too pale body before it slunk out of sight. My heart pounded in my chest and my head felt fuzzy. It became hard to breathe and I fought to keep from passing out. I was scared out of my mind because whatever this thing had been, it was not a human. It wasn't an animal. This was a monster. I didn't sleep that night. I built the fire and huddled around it, clutching my rifle until the morning. Screw tradition. Screw these woods. I was heading back to the cabin at first light and wasn't stopping till I reached it. Nothing else happened through that night, but as dawn broke over the mountains, my nerves were shot to hell and my eyes ached with a strain of keeping them open. I stumbled to my feet, kicked out the fire, and slung my backpack over my shoulder. Left the hammock tied where it was and set toward the stream. I was going to follow the trail. I'd be back at cabin before nightfall. It took an hour of walking, stumbling over uneven terrain until I found the stream. And from there I found the worn trail. I followed that for hours as the sun rose high in the sky. I was so tired, but the fear of death and that creature were the only things that kept me from kept me putting one foot in front of the other. I was starving, thirsty, and beyond everything else, utterly exhausted. But I kept pushing forward, no matter how slow and tired I was. I still had the rabbit tied up in my pack, but I couldn't stop and eat. As the day wore on, I began to recognize parts of the terrain that I had known. I was close to the cabin. I was so elated that I didn't pay attention to where I was walking and rolled my ankle on a small rock that jutted out from the side of the trail, lost my balance, and creaned off and hit my head on a nearby tree branch. Everything went black. I woke at dusk. I'd been out for a couple of hours, whether from the blow to the head or exhaustion, whichever it was, I was still in the woods and night was coming. 
The monsters never appeared during the daytime, so I thought I was safe in the light, but light was running out, and I still had a mile or so till I reached the cabin. I picked myself up the ground and dusted myself off, grabbed my rifle, checked that it was still loaded, and flicked the safety off. My fingers stood a millimeter from the trigger, and I kept my head on a swivel as I hastily jogged the trail back to the cabin. Relief swept over me while I saw the wraparound porch come into view. I had made it back. Dad, I yelled as I ran up to the porch. Dad, we gotta go. I ran to the front door and stood in shock as my blood ran cold. The door to the cabin was open and my dad was lying halfway inside and halfway on the porch. He had been mauled. His body was nothing but ribbons and scraps of flesh and only half resembled a human. I stared in silence, my mind not comprehending what I was seeing. He'd been wearing a red and black checkered flannel shirt I had got him for his birthday. It was the only way I could tell it was my dad. His face had been ripped from his skull. Two white bone peeked out from his empty eye sockets. The stench was ungodly, a mixture of fresh meat and iron tang of blood filled the air. I clutched at my stomach and hurled bile on the floorboards sinking to my knees as my throat burned and I heaved my guts out. Absolute panic gripped my sanity and took it for a joyride. I tried to, I tried and failed to come to terms with the fact that my dad was now dead and had been ripped to pieces by whatever was outside there stalking me. I had to leave. I had to get as far away from this place as possible or else I'd be next. I screamed wordlessly and backed away from the porch. I turned and ran to the truck. It was my only avenue of escape, and I had to hurry. Night had already fallen. I scrambled to the driver's side of the pickup and yanked on the handle hard enough and broke it, but it held and opened the door. After a second of sticking, I climbed into the cab and threw down the visor where my dad usually kept the keys. They weren't there. The only other place they'd be is in my dad's jean pockets. I'd have to get them. Stealing myself for the inevitable, I clutched my rifle tight and exited the vehicle. I knew I had to be fast. I knew I needed to be all ready to be far away from the woods, but my feet wouldn't carry me any further. I stared at the mutilated remains of my dad, trying not to throw up or break down in sadness and madness. I squinted through my eyelashes, patting my dad's pockets. The keys were in his left pocket, so I quickly grabbed them. I stepped to the side and dug them out. My hands clutched around a metal key and I yanked my prize free, nearly stumbling. With the key in my hand, I bolted from the porch back to the truck, and as I reached the open cab, something thudded against the wood, and I turned, searching for the sound. Movement from above drew my gaze and I finally got a good look at what had been chasing me through these woods. It was on the roof of the cabin, clinging to the side of the slanted roof with ease. This creature was humanoid, but it crawled on all fours like an animal. Its skin was pale white like paper and thick and rough, almost leathery. But what marked it as being something inhuman was its head. It bore ethereal blue eyes that lit up the night and a large angular face that tapered to a point near its mouth its mouth open revealing minuscule needle-like teeth the creature's eyes never left mine and glinted this malicious intelligence it upturned its too many teeth into a gruesome smile i didn't think didn't panic just reacted and raised my rifle and fired the bullet whizzed past its head and took it in the shoulder. Bright blood spurted from the wound and splashed across the roof. It let out this high-pitched shriek and recoiled in shock. It slid down the roof and into the trees faster than I could line up the second shot. When it broke from my line of sight, I sprinted to the truck tossed my bag and rifle in and slid on the driver's seat. Thankfully, the truck started on the first try. The engine roared to life. I flicked on the high beams and threw the truck in reverse and spun around as fast as I could. 
I was driving recklessly, taking curves too sharply and doing everything in my power not to fishtail into a tree when a thud landed on the roof of the truck. I screeched, panicked, and jerked the wheel, trying to throw whatever was off on was that whatever was on top of the truck off. I spun the wheel too much and clipped an overgrown tree. I tried to overcorrect myself but ended up slamming to the side of the truck into the tree line. The truck came to a halt. The passenger side crumpled like a bent can as tree branches snapped, sounding wooden gunshots through the forest, sending wooden gunshots through the forest. Whatever was on the truck was flung to the side as we crashed. It fell off the hood and hit the tree further into the forest. I believe I heard its bones crack when it hit the dirt. It left a smear of blood across the bark. I tried to start the truck again, but it just groaned and wouldn't turn over. With a half growl, half groan, the creature picked its bloody body off the ground, glaring at me, its bluish eyes glowing brighter and shrieking and crawling toward me. I grabbed my rifle and left the truck. I could follow the monster by its eyes alone. I perched the rifle on the hood of the truck and took aim. It was slow as it crept toward me, giving me plenty of time to line up my shot. I had my crosshair centered right between its eyes and rested my finger on the trigger. A split second away from firing, the creature let out another roar. Much higher this pitch than the others, my body jerked. My hand splashed and squeezed the trigger. My shot went wide, flying off into the woods and thudding into an old tree. That had been my last bullet. My rifle only had four shots, and I hadn't brought an extra. I squeezed the trigger again and again, and terror gripped me as it slunk along the earth, leaving this white trail of what I assume blood. I threw the gun at it and ran for the truck, searching for my knife in my bag. I wasn't going to let this thing kill me. I wasn't going to end up as food or as a mutilated corpse like my dad. I was either going to kill this thing or I was going to die trying. I was not going to let it eat me. The thing was on me before I reached the cab. It slammed into, it slammed into the side door, pinning me as I was halfway to the door. I lunged for my bag as this creature opened its jaws wide and bit through the part of the metal like it was cardboard. It ripped a chunk free. My hand closed around my bag and I tore the strings, grabbing my knife that was at the top of the bag. It slid. I slid it from the sheath as the creature was posed to bite me. I jammed the knife to the hilt to the side of its face just below its eyes. It reared back in pain, sending a mind-pounding shriek. It stopped my heartbeat for a second, this shriek, as it jumped away from the truck, trying to dislodge my knife. I thought then I had landed a lucky blow and it was going to leave, that I'd be able to get back to the truck and escape. But more howls joined the first and the two after, and two more monsters slunk from the shadows. This is where I die, I thought. I couldn't run from them. I couldn't fight. I was going to die, but I wasn't going to make it easy. I grabbed my torn bag and ran into the woods. I was desperate to escape. But the howls and thuds of too many legs padded through the dirt behind me. I wouldn't escape. There was They were close to my heels. The only thing that saved my life that night was gravity and my own clumsiness. I tripped on a branch and tumbled to the ground as one of them sailed over me. I backpedaled but hit a tree as it lunged the second time. With nothing else in my hands, I brought my bag as it clamped down, throwing me to the forest floor. Its teeth closed around my bag, ripping the nylon to shreds. But my mini shovel got lodged in its mouth. It wasn't able to close its mouth all the way. Clothing and food poured out of the bag, and I scrambled out from underneath this creature. 
My hand hit something plastic as I crawled away from the creature, and even in the dark of the woods, I couldn't fail to make out the bright orange handle of my dad's flare gun. It was a long shot, but this was the last weapon I had, and I clung to it as I stood up running away. I didn't get far as this creature chomped down and ran for me. Knowing I had only one shot, I stopped, dropping to my knees and fired. Daylight split the night as my eyes were obliterated by the burning red flare that streaked through the air and hit this creature. Like it had been doused in kerosene, the creature went up in flames. Its flesh sizzled and popped like grease. It howled in agony, screaming in this high-pitched sound. I fell to my knees as my consciousness waned. By the time I rose to my feet and wiped the blood from my ears, it was dead. It was now nothing but charred carcass. The flare still burnt, illuminating the night, and showed me the other two creatures that had crept up on us. I was out of weapons and out of hope, but they stayed back just in the tree line watching me. Fire was their weakness, it seemed. Even though I had no more flames, I bluffed them. It was almost reckless thing that I could have done, but I had no more options. I raised the empty flare gun. They took a step back and stayed low to the ground. I pressed my luck and took a step forward, and they turned and ran deeper into the forest, howling. As soon as they were out of sight, I ran myself. I ran as fast as my legs would carry me, not caring about scrapes, scratches from the branches whipping me in the face. I only cared about my own survival. I hit the road leading to the highway and ran. There were too many miles between me and the highway, but I didn't care. I just kept running. By the time I finally hit pavement, it was daybreak, and I knew I couldn't stop. I just kept on because I had nothing else but to run. If I would stop, it would mean accepting what just happened, and I didn't want to accept it yet. I ran until I hit the gas station. We had stopped at only a couple days before. What felt like a lifetime ago, the gas station attendant took one look at me, out of breath with blood, torn clothing, and called the police. He gave me some water as we waited for the police, and I drank it in silence, huddled to myself. It took the police nearly an hour to arrive from the nearest town, and when they did, I finally had to tell them the experience. Of course they didn't believe me because of course they wouldn't, right? It sounded insane, raving about monsters with glowing blue eyes. However, the officer was patient and kind, taking down my statement word for word, despite the skepticism on his face. I told them where to find the cabin and the truck. They found it, right where I told them, but there was no sign of the creature I had killed. My dad's body was also gone. The only sign that had been there was bloodstains. The police chalked it up as a wild animal attack, attributing my story to that, a story by a scared teenager who witnessed an animal kill his dad. Reporters, the kids at school, hell, even my mom, they didn't believe me. But I know what happened, and I'm not crazy. There is something evil in that forest. Whatever it is, there is more than them, more than that one. If you camp out in Tennessee's forests at night, be careful. Please take my warning and, for the love of God, start a huge fire and carry a firearm. Uh, <clears throat> I did look into this and there are numerous attacks in the Tennessee woods. Um, labeled as bear attacks and a lot of them are strange uh, I read quite a few um, there are just too many too many strange attacks in Tennessee in the woods to even you know yeah bear are large and obviously will attack if hungry but we're talking about a black bear you know and going through 
bear attacks in Tennessee and deaths in the Tennessee woods that are unexplained too blew my mind. Um, I do believe I found the exact account that this guy's talking about, um, but it supposedly, I don't have a date to this, but the one that I did find was in 2017. And uh, it's definitely sounds like uh, one of the cover-ups that I talk about a lot on the channel. Um, once again, I wasn't there. I don't know. I did look into it and there is an attack that sounds just like this one. Um, minus his story, but talks about a teenager and a dad, the dad being consumed by a bear. I don't know. Uh, God, I say it all the time. There are things out in these woods that are more scary and more terrifying than a friggin' dog man and a Bigfoot. And if these things are demons, you know, I don't have another word for them. DJ, my friend in Virginia, um, had heard from one of his friends that these things were referred to by the government as pale demons. Sasquatch would be, what, the black, black, something and black cow and the dog man black dog or something like that they have names for these creatures and they will keep this these attacks secret from us we just have to look to read between the lines and understand which is an attack and by a wild animal and what ones aren't um you know i do recall 2021 uh, 2020, actually, there was a woman in a park in Tennessee and she had been attacked by what people said was, a few people saw her being attacked by what some said was a bear and others said was a German shepherd. And, uh, Shortly thereafter, I had heard from someone else that there was a sighting of a dog man probably a couple of miles away from that area where she had been attacked. But it was crazy because people were witnessed the attack. Um she she perished but witnessed the attack and a few people said hey it was the largest german shepherd wolf like creature or it was a bear and um you know you've got cock county tennessee the two attacks there the two bodies that were found in cave systems torn apart tennessee is a hot spot all right, guys, so that was tonight's night ending bonus. It's kind of hard to even say I hope you enjoyed it um, because of how horrific it is. It is just a uh, terrifying and heartbreaking experience this young man went through. Um, I can only hope that, you know, he got help afterward with dealing with everything you know and uh it, it, like it's right up there it is right up there with jesse and his son you know it's really a a tragic one for me so with that being said thank you for supporting the channel your support is what continues for this channel to grow and go and what makes it a place for people to share their experiences their ideas and theories without ridicule or judgment, just simply treated with the respect that they deserve. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on your children, your pets, your family, and friends. These creatures are real, they are out there, and they are dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time.
Never stop asking questions. Never stop searching for the answers. And God bless.